Our speaker today, uh, Dr. Anthony F. Avini, is a Russell Colgate University, uh, I'm sorry, Russell Colgate Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of Astronomy, Anthropology, and Native American Studies at Colgate University, where he's taught since 1963. Dr. Avini helped develop the field of archaeoastronomy and is now considered the founder of one of the founders of Mesoamerican archaeoastronomy, in particular for his research of astronomical history of the Mayan Indians in ancient Mexico. Dr. Avini is a lecturer, speaker, and editor, author of three dozen books on ancient astronomy. Uh, we recently, uh, my wife and I heard him on On the Media, and uh, we figured, what the heck, we're on Zoom, shoot for the stars. Uh, Ask for the people that are most interesting. And my goodness, uh, Dr. Avini said yes. And I'm so excited to introduce him to you, Dr. Anthony Avini. I wanna thank you, Michelle, and all you lovely people for inviting me to talk about a topic that's been on everyone's mind lately. It fits into SDA's wonder more category, I think. You know, Renaissance philosopher Giambattista Alberti once said, we all own only three things, our bodies, our possessions, and our time. And during this extended time out, the pandemic has called on all of us. We've been asking questions like, how long will this go on? How long will I be furloughed? How long must I be shuttered? How will I be able to pay rent due on the first? And I thought this might be a good time to reflect a bit on what time actually is. Anyway, this is a book I wrote 30 years ago, and I've been getting a lot of requests to talk about it lately with this, this pandemic. In it, I talk about what is this thing that we own, this time? Is it really a thing? We talk about time as if it is a thing. We talk about our good times and bad times and hard times and hot times. We spend time, we save it, we waste it, we kill it, and it flies. We treat it like a commodity. But maybe it's just an idea. Physicist James Clerk Maxwell wrote, time is the recognition of an order in our states of consciousness. Compare that to what St. Augustine wrote a lot earlier. I know what time is until you ask me to explain it, and then I do not know. But the word time gets more space in Webster than the word thing, the word universe, and the word God. So it must be very important. Then there are, there are these cliches you all know about pertaining to time, like time rules life. That's the motto of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. Time is money. Ben Franklin said that. And if I were addressing you on this topic prior to the pandemic, I might ask, do you own a single thing today that was not regulated by the clock? Ever heard of the saying, sports mirrors life? We design our equipment and our, and our bodies to break time's barriers counting our extreme physical exploits in thousandths of a second. Some of you may be old enough to remember when the 10 second 100 yard dash got broken and the four minute mile, remember that? That was a big deal. There's scarcely a sport now where play isn't dominated by the clock. And now even golf with its penalty for slow play. We colonize time, every hour of every day, 24-7, 365. Remember the desk calendar and the calendar on the wall? I remember the one in my mom's kitchen. The red letter days were all colored, Sundays and holidays. The red letter, the red, comes from the color of the robes of the medieval priests in charge of the calendar. Well, today we consult our iPhones to tell us what to do next. And speaking of Charlie Chaplin, Michelle, there's uh, historians blaming the Industrial Revolution for the way we've mechanized time. And there he is, Charlie Chaplin in Modern Times, 1936. He's literally getting ground up in the wheels of time. And some of you may remember Lucy and Ethel 15 years later, going to great ends to keep up with the speedy conveyor belt in the chocolate factory. 
stuffing their shirts and mouths with the morsels that were speeding by them on the conveyor belt. Despite working remotely, many of the demands of labor are still locked in uh, to the clock. Today, we work 20% more than we did in the 1970s. Those who work on an assembly line are trapped in a temporal framework, cogs in a wheel of production. It reminds me of when I worked my way through grad school as the cheese slicer in a busy deli where I participated in one phase of constructing a sandwich. Well, time is money and I sure needed it. Face it, life under the domain of the clock can be stressful. Not so the newer, N-U-E-R, they're a tribe living in the Sudan, South Sudan today. Edward Evans Pritchard, British anthropologist wrote of them in the 1930s, quote, these people do not speak of time as though it were something real, which passes, can be wasted, can be saved. And I do not think they ever experience the same feeling of fighting against time or of having to coordinate activities with an abstract passage of time. Newer are fortunate. That's the last sentence in that quote, newer are fortunate. Time for them is the activity itself. It's the activity itself. There's milking time, eating time, harvest time. Time is simply what you do when you live close to nature. It's what you do. And it was nature that bequeathed us time. Blame some of it on the moon. You can detect time's passage without looking up tide tables. Uh, you'll know what the tide is if you watch the moon. We still hear of the harvest moon and the hunter's moon, which come to us from Native American astronomy. It's what they did in those moons. And when we escape our techno-dominated environment, we can sense time's rhythm if we pay close attention. We can sense time's alternating, alternating quality. We see it in the tides. And those of you who are a little bit older may remember the lyrics of a famous old love song called Ebb Tide. First the tide rushes in, plants a kiss on the shore, then rolls out to sea. The tide becomes a metaphor for the love one person experiences for another, where human feelings rise and fall, just like the tide. But even the lowliest creatures on the planet can detect nature's time. Oysters sense that rhythm. Their lives depend on it. They open and close their shells at feeding time. There was a, an experiment done by Yale University biologist who monitored these oysters by attaching sensitive threads to their shell openings and they could time the opening and closing of the shells when the oysters were feeding. And then they thought to send them these oysters that they collected and studied in a mini aquarium, a sealed mini aquarium to Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And do you know the oysters switched their feeding schedule to fit with the tides that would exist in a hypothetical ocean in the US Midwest? How'd they do that? Well, wrote one of the scientists involved in the experiment, we are dealing here with beings that don't need a clock, yet possess a memory for time. They seem to defy further analysis. They seem to defy further analysis. Here are some 350 million year old corals that give us a record of moon time. They lay down growth ridges every month and you can see them parallel lines working from the bottom up, thicker in the summer months, thinner in the winter months, one ridge per month. Well, I worked with a paleontologist on these corals and we were counting the number of growth ridges going all the way down, the fat ones and the thin ones. And we counted 13 months in a year as opposed to 12. And we didn't wonder for long why that was because 350 million years ago, 
the moon was closer to the earth. It went around the earth faster and the months were shorter. So you could fit 13 into a year. So there you have some 350 million year old creatures keeping track of moon time. But then of course, we in culture did something no different from the corals. So here we are 5,000 years ago when Bronze Age Britons, if we can call them that, captured time. They captured time from nature and monumentalized it. They built their megalithic timepiece at Stonehenge with alignments to the sun and the moon. Here's the summer solstice sunrise captured in the trilithon archway. Well, the Greeks and the Romans segmented the day into hours with the sundial. They were unequal hours because the sun moves faster horizontally around noon than it does late in the day. So you get longer hours early in the morning and later in the afternoon, but you know, you could live with that 2000 years ago, no problem. The Greeks went further. This is the Antikythera mechanism named after an island off the coast of Asia Minor where it was found in a second century BC shipwreck. These gears from the Greeks were used to predict the sun, the moon and planet locations and even eclipses over 2000 years ago. The Greeks called it a simulacrum to simulate nature, but to simulate to the Greeks meant to offer aesthetic satisfaction with nature, to celebrate the glory of the cosmos. But they turned marking time precisely into an obsession and they passed it down to us. Our answer to unfair sundials was to snatch time's alternating rhythm away from nature. Here's the first pendulum clock, 17th century. It transferred the rhythm of the oscillating pendulum, like the rhythm of the beat of your heart, to a bunch of gears that powered a tooth wheel that moved the hands of a clock with a friendly face. But the demand for precise time was joined by religion long before science, for the call to prayer needed to be made at the correct time of day. For we pray together, the better that God will hear us. Remember the sleepy young priest, Frere Jacques? Dormez-vous, sonnez le matina. Well, the matina, the matin, were the first period of nine during the course of the day when you were to pray. So the mechanical clock is not the origin of the interest in measuring time, it's the result of it. By mechanizing time, we chose to carry the burden of it on the shoulders of civilization. We bureaucratized time. In Europe during the Renaissance, the needs of an interlocking market economy collaborated with religion and used the latest technologies to mark accurate time. So here we are in the Marienplatz of Munich where the glockenspiel, literally the talking clock, the clock that spiels, uh, was controlled by the burghers. Oh, those were the guys that ran the town. Um, and it told out the hours of the workers day, particularly in the garment industry, which was a big deal in Munich. So there were cloth cutters bells, sewers bells, packers bells, all signing, signaling different rhythms and tones, telling them when to go to work. Prior to the bells tolling, you knew when it was time to work by the flip of the coin. If you could tell heads from tails, head for work. With the mid 19th century though, the advent of high speed travel, we truly fractured time. By now, you know, Roy Lichtenstein is one of my favorite artists. I love that fractured clock. We fractured it. Until travel by rail came along 200 years ago, the fastest you could go was on the back of a horse. Can you imagine? Only 200 years ago. Once you move fast, especially east and west, the more you mess with time. You set your watch to the station, but when you board the train, the time inside the moving train is not, train is not the same as the time on the ground outside. That's because time is connected with longitude, the Earth's rotation. It's earlier going west, later going east. I got 236 on my watch here. You people haven't had lunch yet. 
And so the conductor needed a reliable watch. I love this commercial ad from the 1950s. You could buy the best watch in the world, and it wasn't a Rolex, for $71.50. Now imagine even higher speed travel, say New York to LA in three hours. Do I knock off one minute every 14 miles that I travel to the West? Better I should do all three hours at once by turning back my watch. So we have zone time. We not only invent time, we process it, manipulate it, digitize it, legalize it, domesticate it, bureaucratize it, commodify it, and segment it into these time zones. Well, thanks to timekeeping by oscillating atoms, today we've split hairs uh, in time from the epoch all the way down to the femtosecond. Femtosecond is one over 10 with 15 zeros after it of a second. How small is that unit of time? Well, if one second is the distance to the moon, one femtosecond is the width of a human hair. Ah, how I long for the days when the one-handed version of the clock's friendly face was good enough. Problem is I can't turn back the clock. Well, unfortunately, this morning, I've only been able to skim the surface of a subject well worth considering and wondering about, you wanderers. But I hope you'll go further by going outdoors and experiencing the sights and sounds that make up nature's world of time. Maybe a little bit of time at night under the stars, or for you, an easy jaunt out to Point Loma to check out the tides. When was the last time you did that? Well, meantime, let me leave you with the hope that your time here in contemplation this morning, and I've been delighted to join you, though I can't hang out with you, that your time will be well spent. Thank you.